All right, I guess I, I should probably come up here with you to pick this up off. Grab a seat here for just a minute. Do you want the mic? Uh, I, I don't want to move it away from you, but okay. we've got it in a good spot. So I'm just going to yell. Here, and then I can take okay. it like this. All right, that's great. I don't want to strangle you with it. No, it's good. It's We've never had an author fatality at Firestorm, so. It's Mr. Knight. Yeah, we're going to keep to our record. Hey, y'all, welcome. Um, so my name is Liberty, um, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, we're a 16-year-old um, cooperative um, here in Asheville, North Carolina, on Cherokee land. Um, and we're operated by a queer feminist collective um, that hosts events like this one. Um, that are of interest to our community and um, that we think are relevant to marginalized people in the South. So tonight we're really excited to have Bill Ayers here, um, who's gonna be uh, sharing um, from his latest book, When Freedom is the Question, um, Abolition is the Answer. Um, so I'm gonna just make sure that folks who are joining virtually know, so we do have two audiences tonight, just to make this clear, it's a little odd. Um, it's a hybrid event, so in addition to uh, you lovely folks who are here in person, um, we also do have some folks who are joining us virtually over Zoom. Welcome to everybody who's virtual. Um, if you are joining virtually, um, there is a Q&A tool on Zoom, uh, and we would welcome you to jot out questions that you've got for Bill as we go, some really hard ones. Um, and we'll do our best uh, to get to those questions as well as questions from our live audience um, before the event is over. So without further ado, uh, Bill Ayers is an author, activist, and educator whose previous books include Fugitive Days, Memoirs of an Anti-War Activist, To Teach, The Journey of a Teacher, and Teaching Towards Freedom, Moral Commitment, and Ethical Action in the Classroom. A founder of both the Small Schools Workshop and the Center for Youth and Society, Ayers has taught courses in interpretive and qualitative research, oral history, creative nonfiction, urban school change, and teaching and the modern predicament. His articles have appeared in many journals, including the Harvard Educational Review, uh, the Journal of Teacher Education, Teachers College Record, Rethinking Schools, The Nation, Educational Leadership, The New York Times, and the Cambridge Journey of Edu uh, Journal of Education. It's a long list, Bill. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy writing schedule to join us um, and to talk about your new book. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Liberty. And um, I was surprised that you read all those elitist journals that I published. In. <laughs> and you didn't mention Streetwise and Underground, and you know, I published in other things, but okay, Cambridge Journal of Education. <laughs> um, it's really a delight to be here, and I think. Thanks to Liberty and to the entire Firestorm Collective. Thank all of you for being here. I want to say before I start talking about the book or about politics, just a one quick note, which is that, you know, Firestorm is, I, I think the entire community has obviously gone through a tremendous upheaval. And one of the things that I think is remarkable is the way people have come together and help one another out and provided mutual aid and solidarity and common good. And I just think I, I salute you so um, vigorously. I also think that we should note that in a time in our country when the public is being erased and disappeared and when the public is receding and the public space is being obliterated in more ways than one, that places like this are of incredible value. And that means that we have to support them. Universities are less hospitable, less public spaces. Public schools are under sustained attack. This is a public space. And for those of you who know it and love it, we have to support it. And so we, we need to, the best way I think to support a, a community like this is to buy a book. And you don't have to buy my book, you can buy any book. Um, Don't be humble. You should buy Bill's book. Hey, by the way, I'm saying if you buy Moby Dick, Bernie Dorn is in the front row, she'll sign it. Right? <laughs> buy anything. But the point is, we we don't really appreciate what the public space provides for us until it disappears, and then we really know what we lost. So let's not lose Firestorm. Let's have it be vital and robust and long living. 
Okay, enough with that. Um, <laughs> that's my pitch for Firestorm. Um, I don't think I'm going to read unless you ask me to. We are a small group gathered here. I think we can have a conversation. And I'll tell you a little bit about the origins of the book and, and where I, what we were hoping to do with it. And then um, I want to have... I want to open it up and have a conversation, either with the folks virtually or those of you in person. Um, Bill, do you want to put the mic back in the stand? Oh, I'm sorry, I certainly do. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? I remembered that that was your preference. That was my preference. Thank you. Um, so this book emerged out of a podcast that I have had for about five or six years. And I've got some stickers about my podcast, which I'll ask you to pick up. But um, Started the podcast about six years ago with a young comrade named Malik Ali. And Malik was the, one of the leaders of Black Lives Matter Chicago, one of the leaders of the Let Us Breathe Collective. Uh, the he was the director of the breathing space and just a terrific young man. And he taught me a ton of things about how to do this and about what to make of it. But what we agreed about from the beginning was that we were interested in unpacking the concept of freedom. And we so what we thought we would do is interview people who think of themselves as freedom fighters or freedom organizers. And we would ask each of them at the end of our conversation, what is freedom? And the more we talked about it, the more fun we had with this idea that the concept of freedom is practically applicated on the American mind. So everyone's for freedom. You know, there's the Freedom Caucus, the right wing group in Congress. There is the, the, the Visa Freedom Unlimited Visa card. You know, there's um, the inseparable Ron DeSantis and his book, The Courage to Be Free. So they're all about freedom. That's what they're talking about. And then there's, of course, the neoliberals and Kamala Harris is running on freedom is her slogan. And then there's things like the freedom movement, which many of us participated in, the, the Black freedom movement. And the latest iteration of the Black freedom, of the centuries old Black freedom movement is a burst of energy that came forth after the murder of George Floyd and very exciting times to live in. So what is freedom anyway? And I, I the more we talked about it, the more we realized that, you know, we think about, for example, the um, the Civil War. Civil War was fought for freedom, right? Freedom for whom? Well, freedom for the enslaved Black workers, the African workers, right? Well, read the documents. The Confederacy was fighting for freedom. That's all over what they write about because it's freedom against this overreaching national government. This is the federals, the federal um, oppressors were coming down. And by the way. We want the freedom to own other people. That's our legacy. That's our tradition. How dare you take our freedom away? And interestingly, when Abraham Lincoln, for example, they freed the, the slaves in the District of Columbia, and Abraham Lincoln signed a bill to give reparations to whom? To the owners of the enslaved workers, because everyone who stayed loyal to the Union and had an enslaved person that they freed was given $300 by the federal government. Freedom. You know, and so you realize that it's a contested, wildly contested um, term. So Malik and I were having a lot of fun thinking about this and kind of putting this together. Um, Malik uh, died tragically three years after we got started in a boating accident of all things. And he, he was in a boat in Wisconsin and flipped over. His three-year-old and his two-year-old were in the boat with him. They were wearing life vests, so they survived. And he went to the bottom. And so we took a break and, and then we restarted six months later. But that's the history that got us to, to that got me started writing this, um, these essays. Um, you know, in, in, in the first iteration of the podcast, our 12 year old granddaughter was one of the hosts and she was marvelous. She, she would tell stories about middle school that would blow your mind about, <laughs> you know, she would tell, tell, you know, kind of the, joking adolescent version of how they were taught sex ed and it was just fucking hilarious you know mm -hmm. um but lighty the, the granddaughter said to me early on she said you know every grown-up man i know has a podcast and i said you know like, <laughs> they're like his uncle her uncle her father me you know they're like weeds they just keep coming up um but we we actually malik and i had so this book came from that moment 
and is dedicated to the memory of Malik Colleen, um, who was a, you know, a super important leader in Chicago, and his spirit is still very much a leading spirit. So we got into this question of unpacking the notion of freedom and what does it mean to be free? And if you, the, the, the working title, which I didn't think we could keep as the title because it takes up the whole cover of the book, huh. but it says when freedom is the question, so we're unpacking freedom, abolition is the answer. And then the subtitle is reflections on collective liberation because that's very much what we get into. Um, collective liberation in a culture and a, a, a history of what's really toxic individualism. You have to underline that when we're talking about freedom and talking about abolition, we're not actually talking about the freedom of the individual to own a slave, for example, or to drill for oil wherever they want, or to build Cop City in the middle of Atlanta, or, you know, that's not what we're talking about because we recognize that freedom for the wolf is death for the sheep, right? I mean, and so we wanted to kind of underline the fact that we're talking against a kind of common sense about freedom as individual, what I can do, my right to drive wherever I want, my right to own this and own that. And we're talking instead about collective liberation. So the way we get into it, the way I get into it, is, is a lot of different kinds of things. To begin with, um, my reference point is um, is the Black Freedom Movement of the 1950s and 60s. That's where I begin my own, you know, growth as a as a radical, and that's also where I begin thinking about this question. Um, and and so from there, I begin to say, you know, one of the ways you know what freedom is is if you can identify unfreedom. If unfreedom is being forced to live in a ghetto and redlined out of the mainstream, well, then freedom must be, must include the possibility of not living in that ghetto. Or if unfreedom is going to a segregated, broken down schoolhouse, then unfreedom must be having, that freedom must be having access to that larger community. And so, so that's one of the ways that I begin to break it down. Another is that, um, that one chapter actually begins with a description of being arrested with this guy in 1968 um, in Chicago and getting beaten up in the streets of Chicago during the Democratic National Convention and being put in a police wagon and bleeding and beaten up and going to prison, going to jail with a group of other people. I felt ecstatic. I felt free. And it was such a weird paradox, right? Why do you feel free when you're in police custody bleeding? Well, and think about it. You feel free because you identified on freedom and you locked arms and, and joined hearts with lots of other people and you went up against the wall and maybe you didn't breach the wall, but you tried and trying is, you know, what it's about. And so the exhilaration of trying with others to correct an injustice, identifying with others, something that was standing in the way of our humanity, that's what made us free. So I'm not against anybody here going home and lying on the couch and smoking a joint and watching the World Series, that's fine. But it's a different idea of freedom than to say what it means to name the enemy of humanity and go up against it. That's a kind of freedom that is hard to describe, but when you've experienced it, you want that freedom high again and again. So freedom is one of the things that I wrestle with a lot. And similarly, the notion of abolition is something that um, we think about a lot, and I, I know it's in the public, you know, it's in the conversation among progressives really broadly and, and widely, and that's really a good thing. Um, but but in, in terms of abolition, when you say the word abolition out in the world, people immediately think of the abolition of slavery. And that's a good starting point. That's a good place to think about it. But abolition can mean so much more. And it can really mean not just the ending of something, but as the great radical and abolitionist Woody Gilmore 
has said, abolition is all about world building. And what she means by that is, what kind of world do we need to create in which slavery is unthinkable? And if that's possible, can we imagine a world without prisons? Can we imagine a world without police? Well, we can, but as Al Valpin said, it's, it's easier to imagine the end of the world, the end of capitalism, because we've seen the end of the world on television and the end of capitalism, who the hell knows what that looks like. But Ruthie's point and Angela Davis's point and Erica Miner's point and Bernadine Dorn's point is you have to begin to think about what kind of a world could we build in which prisons are not necessary. So the abolitionist movement, let's remember, let's go back to the end of the Civil War. I mean, to the Civil War. You know, the abolitionist movement was grinding forward. And imagine us right here, just the 20 of us um, in 1850. And we're abolitionists and we're going to abolish slavery. It's hard to imagine because slavery is the wealth of the nation. It's, intri it's intricately entwined in everything that we do, not just in the South. That's a myth that Northerners like to put forward. No, not just in the South. Every bank, every shipping company, every insurance, every financial institution was entangled in slavery. But we're going to end it, the 20 of us. We're determined that we're going to end it. And what do we do? We leaflet, we knock on doors, we support certain candidates, and we work our asses off. But we don't really know our North Star is the end of slavery. But who could guess that 15 years later, it would be done. And I think if you put yourself in 1850, you recognize how wildly radical, how unbelievably nuts, and in a great way, that was. Because if you were opposed to slavery in 1850, and we all would have been, we know that now, um, good for us. Um, but we, we would have been against the Constitution, the founders, the law, our parents, the Bible, our preacher, go right to our neighbors, go right down the line. But okay, the 20 of us would have done it. But the real question is, what can we do now as today's abolitionists standing on the shoulders of other abolitionists to change the world and build a world that we know is necessary and it's possible, but it's just way out on the horizon. It's something we can see, but we don't, don't know quite how to get there, but we can do what they did, write leaflets, build media, uh, read books, study, think, act together. And we, we, we'll do all the things I mentioned, plus build a little bit of an underground and Bernie, Bernie will be in charge of that. And, um, you know, the, but the point is that um, it seems unthinkable now but it seemed unthinkable then too. I want to give you a more modern example. In Illinois, 20 years ago this year, we abolished the death penalty. Nobody, 30 years ago, no one in Illinois would have said we could do it, but we did do it. And how did we do it? Well, first of all, the engine for the abolition of slavery was the escaping workers themselves. That was the engine of the crisis. That it was nobody else. I mean, that's who, the Haitian Revolution created pandemonium in Virginia, but it was the, it was the self-liberating slave. And you know what the average age of a self-liberating enslaved worker was? 15. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Who's going to run? And when you're a fugitive, we were fugitives for 11 years. When you're a fugitive, you're running from something and you're running towards something. You're not yet free, mm -hmm. but you're running. And I think that's, that's an important kind of thing. So the death penalty in Illinois, the way that the abolitionist movement started was the guys on death row themselves began to say, we don't want to die. I mean, they always said we don't want to die, but they began to say it collectively. And a man named Stanley Howard, we're having a party next week in the house for Stanley. He's been out of prison for exactly one year. But 20 years ago, 25 years ago, he started a law class on death row. And the law class, he convinced the authorities that he should be able to teach law and that the guys would benefit from studying law and from the point of view of the authorities, keep busy and you know, whatever. But they started this thing and as often happens, 
a public came into view when they started talking to each other. What I mean by that is they began to realize that the circumstances of their situation were actually very similar. There were, there were overlaps. So for example, 10 of the guys, there were 24 people on death row. 10 of them had been tortured by the same police captain in Chicago, a guy named John Burge. And they, and they didn't know that when they first were on death row. And they were all tortured into confessions. And those 10 were falsely accused. Those 10 were, were actually eventually proven to be not guilty of what. Now, I, I don't want to make too big a distinction on this because our friend Ronaldo Hudson, who we work very closely with, he was 38 years in the Illinois prison, 12 on death row. And he says, he always says two things. I love the Innocence Project. People who were falsely charged, falsely convicted should be out, but I was guilty. And so what do you do with me? I'm still human. I fucked up and I'm still worthy of a life and of a human life. And he also says, I, I love the second chances. I think that's a great idea, second chances. I never had a first chance. I didn't meet anyone on death row who had a first chance. So these guys suddenly are talking to each other. They're identifying themselves as part of a public, right? And they begin, they get a name. Stanley tells a wonderful story about how he was gonna call it the John Burge 10. <laughs> but that's the name of the commander who tortured them. And he said, that's fucked up. That's not going to get me attention. That's not, that doesn't sing. So he called himself the Death Row 10. An organizer on the outside, a young woman who's still in the movement for, for abolition, Alice Kim, organized their mothers into a group called the Mothers of the Death Row 10. They met with the governor eventually. They, they, Alice then started a thing called Live from Death Row. And this was one of the guys would call out on a phone and we would amplify it in a church basement or in a university auditorium. Now we're having a radio show live from death row. So Fred Morton once said, our dreams of freedom were hatched in a hold of a slave ship. How can you imagine, you know, we think we got it bad. You're on death row. How do you have the courage, the audacity, the, the, the agency to say, I'm a person. I'm not going to allow this to happen without me linking arms and standing up against it. So if they can do it, we can do it. And, and you know, 20 years ago, Illinois, and it was our mildly corrupt, not mildly, our mildly right wing, wholly corrupt governor who did it, who cleared death row. And not out of the goodness of his heart. It never happens out of the goodness of the hearts of the powerful. You know, again, going back to slavery, you know, I, I doubt that any of you has read Abe Lincoln's first inaugural address because it's not in your textbook. That's the one where he genuflects in front of the slave owners and says, I have no legal right and I have no inclination to interrupt your enterprise. Mm -hmm. Holy shit, Abe, I didn't know you were that bad. 1860, yes, he was that bad. 1864, the second inaugural address, that's the one we all read in school. That's the one where he says, for every drop of blood drawn by the lash, we will draw a drop of blood by the sword. For every hour of unpaid labor, we will pay for that labor. Holy shit, reparations? And, get, and I mean, that's the one you remember. I've always thought that was probably written by Frederick Douglass. Certainly, the ideas were from Frederick Douglass. But... But that's the shift. And what happened in those four years? Well, a civil war happened and a crisis happened and the abolitionist movement never gave up, it was on the move and, and then it happened. So I'm only saying this because I think that we need to think more deeply and less narrowly about what, what we're capable of. And what I try to argue here is that abolition is an entire politics it's not a policy, it's not a simple demand, it's an entire way of thinking about, about liberation and what it is we want and naming obstacles and then wanting to abolish them, not to reform them. I have one little story in the book that I get a kick out of one. My friend Maya Shenmore has a three-year-old and she was reading him a book about, um, about the, the grandmothers uh, on the reservation who blocked a pipeline 
and she it's a kid's book you know it's it is what it is and and she gets to the end of the book and he says i want to join the picket with the grandmothers and she said what will your sign say and he said no pipeline of course what the hell you're gonna say <laughs> maybe you could draw your pipeline in a different area maybe you could kill other fish no a three-year-old is a natural abolitionist just like they're natural anarchists they they get it you know and so i, I just love that that idea because without a lot of thought about you know should we play pay you know carbon um you know debts and so on and so on. No, we, we should understand that our North Star is no pipeline. Our North Star is abolition. And I think that, you know, the North Star that you develop collectively in your minds doesn't have to be worked out thoroughly. It doesn't have to be, and in fact, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a map in detail, but it should be something that's organic, natural, changing, open to change, but nonetheless, something we're fighting for. I remember 30 years ago, I think, probably, Bernie and I had um, hosted a gathering in our living room with Albie Sachs, who was a fighter with the African National Congress and later on the High Court in South Africa, the Constitutional Court, and Rashid Khalidi, the, the great Palestinian scholar, whose book is for sale right over there, 100 Years of, of uh, War Against Palestine. It's called 100 Years of something like that. We asked Rashid you know, a couple of months ago, somebody, we were having a public forum and somebody said, so uh, the war against Palestine, when did it really begin? You mentioned you have a book 100 years ago. He said, well, let me think. I think it began in 1492. So, you know, if you want to understand colonialism, let's, let's look at the big picture. But, um, <clears throat> But, but this, this uh, question, Albi and Rashid were in our living room having a conversation. And somebody said to Albi, <clears throat> how did you keep the fight going for so many years against the apartheid? And you know, there are many answers to that. But one of the things <clears throat> that Albi said was, we would take <clears throat> time off every few months and go into retreat and discuss where we were going we would discuss our North Star and we would do it with all the cadre. And many people would say, we don't have time for that. We're in a war, we can't stop and think about shit like that. We're too consumed with the everyday. And Albie said that leadership argued that if you don't know where you're going, you won't know how to fight in the here and now. Mm -hmm. Every day, every week, every month, you have to make a new concrete analysis of concrete conditions because Conditions keep changing and we keep changing and the struggle keeps changing. So, you know, naming the political moment is not something you do once and then put on automatic pilot. It's a constant thing. And Albie said, without knowing where we were going and rethinking it again and again, we would have made more major mistakes than we did make. And we made plenty of mistakes, but we would have done worse if we hadn't taken time out. And I think there's real wisdom in that. So, um, you know, I remember, um, I often think about the, the, the woman in um, Heather Hoyer who was killed in Charlottesville. And you remember, she had a, a slogan on Facebook that I've seen on bumper stickers before and since. And the slogan was, if you're not pissed off, you're not paying attention. And I think that's absolutely true that if you're not infuriated today with a pre-announced genocide against the Palestinian people, a proxy war in Europe, or a cold war rising in Asia, women being asked to step back into the Middle Ages, um, you know, democracy on life support with its feeble institutions and, you know, all the things going on. If you're not pissed off about that, you're really not paying attention and we should be more pissed off. On the other hand, if you're only pissed off, you can't get to where we need to go. So that requires us to think hard with each other about where do, we, where do we think we're going and how do we think we'll get there? And then we have to adjust and adapt and all that. But Bernie and I, we're in a, we have a favorite Palestinian restaurant on the south side of Chicago, owned by an old man that we've known for four decades. 
And we were in there the other day, and his son now runs the restaurant, but the old man was there. And he came to sit with us and talk. And of course, he was furious and grieving. And the loss is unspeakable. And it's hard not to avert your eyes because it's so horrendous what's going on. And then he said the most remarkable thing to us. He said, as angry as I am, as, as grieving as I am, I'm also suddenly hopeful. Because if you'd asked me two years ago if large numbers of, of American people would understand the reality of what Israel is and what we're suffering, I would say, you're nuts. American people will never understand it. And suddenly, that narrative has been challenged. And in large measure, the narrative has been changed. So now, and, and it's really thanks to the Palestinian diaspora, thanks to their Students for Justice in Palestine, thanks to Jewish Voice for Peace, thanks to the dissenters, thanks to the encampments, thanks to many of you. But the narrative is changing. And I think that this guy, in the midst of all that he's seen and all the grief, to be able to hold up that hope gives us hope. It makes us realize that you, you, can, you can have more than one thing going on in your mind at, at one time. So um, I am both angry and hopeful. Um, just say one last thing about being hopeful. I'm sometimes accused, I think Alan once accused me of being an optimist, <laughs> and I am not an optimist because an optimist knows what's going to happen. My mother and Karl Marx were optimists. They're um, <laughs> alive with them together. But, you know, but pessimists and optimists share a certain quality, which is they know what's going to happen. But because I don't have any idea what's going to happen, I choose to be hopeful. So I tend to get up every morning thinking, it's your taste for me sometimes, every morning thinking, maybe today we'll overthrow capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> I, I go to bed disappointed. But it, it doesn't stop me from having a general orientation that says, look at history. The day before Rosa Parks sat in, nobody predicted that the modern civil rights movement would be unleashed. The day after, every commentator said it was inevitable. It wasn't inevitable, but it did happen. And the day before every revolution, it's impossible. And the day after, it's inevitable. So I think that we should choose hope as a possibility. And even though I'm not an optimist at all, I am a hopeful person. And I'm a bit of an, I'm often accused of being an idealist. Guilty, I have ideals. Um, even of being a utopian and um, guilty. I think, in fact, I'm such a utopian that I spent a lot of time in the, in the encampments in the spring. I felt that was utopia. That's where I want to live the rest of my life. It was a place that, I mean, you know, wasn't always comfortable, you know, sleeping on the ground and so on, but it was, it was, it was mutual aid. It was solidarity, it was taking care of each other. It was learning. I mean, the number of Rashid Talibi's books that flew out the door at the University of Chicago encampment was staggering. I mean, wow. So this is where I want to live. I want to, we were, we were actually talking with the great Uruguayan revolutionary Eduardo Galeano. You may have his books here too. Um, Galeano, uh, and we were chatting and Galeano and I both realized that we've been accused of being a utopian in our lives, in fact, all the time. And Galliano had the best response. He said, I was talking to a guy a couple of years ago and he said, what good is utopia? And I thought about it and I said, yeah, you know, he has a point. I take, I walk two steps towards utopia. Utopia walks two steps away. I walk 10 steps towards utopia. Utopia walks 10 steps away. So what good is utopia? Galliano said, it's good for walking. And that's good enough for me. It's good for walking. It's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a world without prisons, a world without police, a world where we take care of each other, a world where we're in solidarity with each other, not service, but solidarity. Back arm in arm. I got your back, you got my back. Comrades, not allies. And in that spirit, I want to move forward with hope, with grace, 
and pissed off at the same time. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. <laughs>
because it's too hard being in the movement. Well, then you've abandoned your ideals. You, 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 you're not living a life according to your values. So, so just falling back into individualism and my own comfort is not an answer. On the other hand, going up against the wall again and again and again and banging your head against the wall without enjoying a good meal and a bottle of wine with friends is a mistake because you can't sustain it. Nobody can and nobody should. So I think it's somehow leading that dialectical life that gives me hope. I want to love my own life. In fact, in Chicago, we have a very vibrant movement, a peace movement, very vibrant, uh, you know, anti-genocide movement. And I think that one of the great things that we do in Chicago is we have potlucks every couple of weeks just to be with each other. We, we find social ways. And a lot of our young comrades, Malik al brother-in-law, Damon Williams, often says, Having being joyful is uh, is a, a kind of a blow against the empire. Loving ourselves, loving the black community, that's a, a blow in itself against the oppression that we face. So I think it's something like that, remember, something like finding a way to enjoy each other, to love each other, to forgive each other, to have grace toward each other, and at the same time, get serious about wanting to make a difference. Similar question, it's silly that people sometimes say is, what's the best thing I could do? Well, shit, if we do the best thing we could do, we all do it, but we don't know. And so I'm drawn to Miriam Kava, our brilliant Chicago organizer. You probably have her books here. She's phenomenal. She now lives in New York and she, she deserted us, but we still love her. <laughs> but Miriam, Miriam's uh, a, a world-class organizer, kind of an Ella Baker of today. Uh, Miriam says, don't try to figure out what the, important, the most important thing to do is. Instead, try a million experiments. And, she, and this idea that there's something going on here, something going, there's a bookstore here, there's a community garden there, there's, you know, give away, helping one another is here. There are so many projects going on, if you open your eyes to it, in every corner of this country and the world. So that's what we should build on, the million experiments, the million attempts, and link them up and build a movement. And as I implied earlier, but I'll just mention it again, there is no change without collective action. There's no change without fire from below. It never comes from the hearts or minds of the powerful. And you think about it, I mentioned Abe Lincoln, you know, who it took a civil war and a massive um, self-liberating and abolitionist movement, but he eventually did move. But then you think more recently, you think of Lyndon Johnson. He wasn't a hero of civil rights. He was a cracker from Texas. He was also an effective politician. But when the fire came from below, Johnson engineered the passage of the most far-reaching civil rights legislation since Reconstruction. Or you think of Franklin Roosevelt, a patrician from the Hudson Valley. He was not a union guy, he was not our friend, but fire from below, the union movement, the, the rising you know, organization of labor, which was irresistible, forced Franklin Roosevelt to pass the most far reaching social legislation and labor legislation in history. Now, both of those, both of those accomplishments, of course, have been counter revolution has moved against all of that, but that doesn't stop us from recognizing what we can learn from it. So I often think, you know, I often think that not only is it my job to build the fire from below, my job is not real politics, although I pay attention to it. And if you'd like, I'll tell you why I voted um, and why I think you should vote especially in North Carolina. I'm, I'm going to tell you that. She looks surprised. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, you can hear that. But first, let me say that um, I think the left progressive people often spend too much time looking at the sites of power we have no real access to. Wall Street, the Pentagon, the White House, the medieval auction block called the Congress, and too little time looking at the sites of power we have absolute access to, the neighborhood, the workplace, 
the church, the house of worship, the school, the classroom. We can go on and on, but we have access that we don't recognize, and we have power that we don't recognize, and we spend too much time obsessing about the power we don't have access to. And I, I, I really resist that, and I urge us all to be organizers and to be stoking that fire from below, because that they will have to respond to. And then you hope that when that moment comes, there is an Abraham Lincoln or a Franklin Roosevelt, to, you know, who's doing real politics and can do something. You made a skeptical look though when I said that I voted. So <laughs> oh, I, oh well, hell, uh, I'm just curious. I guess, um, and it's inter it's so beautiful to be in the same room with you and Bernadine, and uh, I actually had this a similar kind of like argument with my dad who was involved in SDS in the 60s and he wanted me to vote too. And, um... <laughs> I was but yeah, I guess, I guess something I've been thinking about, especially in the context of the storm and ecological collapse is like being in this like present utopia in like these couple of weeks where we are like, providing collective care for each other and being in this, like, you know, you're talking about having how it's difficult to imagine the end of capitalism. And like, I think we're living in times where the end of the world and the end of capitalism are like coinciding in these moments, you know? Um, but yeah, I guess I've also noticed like as the weeks pass, people kind of being sort of um, like there's been a pivot a little bit towards like looking to authorities and like their, you know, like different agencies coming in and seeing their failures and I don't know. I, I guess I'm I'm a voting agnostic. Sort of. well, I'm, I'm a voting but, fan, so let me let me make okay. an argument. Yeah. The question is to repeat the question. The question is about whether one should vote and what voting means. Since I just gave a pitch for fire from below and not spending too much time worrying about, you know, kind of real politics, mm -hmm. why am I saying so forcefully that I voted that I think you should too? And I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, two things can be true at the same time. And I often argue with myself and others that you have to hold contradiction in your head all the time. It's not one thing, it's many things happening at once. And contradiction is the basic universal experience of humanity. So we tend in the West and in America to run away from contradiction. We wanna solve it, this is right. Voting yes, voting no. And it's not quite that simple in my mind. Um, so two things can be true at the same time. The lesser of two evils can still be evil and the lesser of two evils can still be lesser. So that I think is where I start. And I am a full-time activist, organizer, political person, full-time. That's really all I do. Um, sometimes I do it through writing, sometimes through organizing, sometimes through participating in actions, but that's what my life is and has been pretty much my whole adult life. Um, but I've always voted. I voted. And Bernie and I used to have these funny arguments because she didn't vote. And I would go out and vote. And, uh, and I always felt very, you know. We want to hear from Bernadine next. Yeah, yeah Bernadine. No, she's the heckler. She's, <laughs> she's by the way, I Justice. Well, wait, I'm going to get there. <laughs> I'm going to get there. But uh, I've, I've actually won Bernadine over so she can talk oh, about yeah, okay. it. So, bummer for the anarchist. <laughs> but being an anarchist myself, I'm going to still explain to you how I think about it. I agree with you that we're not going to vote our way to a revolution. I agree with uh, Marx, who said that, you know, voting in the bourgeois democracy is basically choosing which you know, overlord is gonna run your affairs for the next four years. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I also agree that the Electoral College, the Senate and the Supreme Court make voting seem silly sometimes. So we're in Illinois, I can vote for anyone I want. Doesn't matter why the anti-democratic Electoral College is gonna take my vote away. My vote is worth one two hundredth of a vote in Montana. You know, that's unfair and that's a result of slavery. And, the legacy of slavery and so on. So I get all that. Voter suppression is real. 
Um, and voter suppression doesn't just include gerrymandering and the obvious things. It includes money in politics. It includes Citizens United. I mean, what, what chance do we have when Elon Musk could give a million dollars away a day for the rest of the year? Um, what chance does, do we have? And advertising and bickering and all the lying and all the bullshit. I get all that. Those are all reasons. And the difference seems like Tweedledum and Tweedledumber. Why should I vote for Tweedledum to vote against Tweedledumber? And by the way, the difference between the two parties is one inch. But, ah. but a lot of vulnerable people live in that inch. Most of the vulnerable people that I care about live in that inch. So I'm not going to, so that's, all those are reasons that I understand that people are skeptical about voting. But let me make the argument about why I vote. Because I'm, I'm an organizer 365 days a year. That's my real work. Voting takes 15 minutes. And I'm not voting for a friend. I'm voting for my next opponent. Mm -hmm. I, and, and, and that's important. Or as Rebecca Solnit says, I'm not voting. I'm not, my vote isn't sending a valentine. It's a chess move. So which territory do I want to organize on? Do I want to organize in a fascist territory or a neoliberal? What, what, where are my better chances of making a difference? And if you think, if you're, now you're an anarchist, so you're not uh, an, an apathetic, you're not an apathetic person who's saying, yeah, people who are apathetic say, oh, politics, what does, you may not care about politics, but politics cares about you. Or you may not care about bourgeois politics, but bourgeois politics cares about you. And the two most recent examples that we all know is that Dobbs was a serious, serious decision that had serious consequences for real people. And Dobbs did not have to happen. And Dobbs happened because Donald Trump was president. And he supported a third. He, he um, nominated and won a third of the Supreme Court with Mitch McConnell's help. So, if he had not been elected, we had we would not have had Dobbs. That matters. The other one is climate change. You know, you can say all you want, and I will say it with you about the Democrats and the ridiculousness of their policies here and there. But actually, they recognize in the Biden administration for all of its terrible, terrible things, and I could catalog them with you. Um, actually, on climate, they've gone further than anyone ever went or expected them to go. I think that's worth noting because, again, you can say Tweedledum, Tweedledumber, but the Tweedledum is different than the Tweedledumber. Okay, I also get <laughs> irritated with self-righteousness, so I can't, I can't stand my friends, I wrote a little polemic, which I'm going to give you uh, to the anarchist. Um, and I am an anarchist. But my polemic basically says, I just can't stand some of my pals who say to me, look at me, man, I'm so cool, I didn't vote. The only thing that irritates me more than that is the stickers that say I voted. I always want to run up to them and say, did you do anything else? That's it. You know, come on, get busy, motherfucker. You know, I mean, in other words, I don't think I voted or I didn't vote is how you should define yourself. And I think it takes 15 minutes. It will make a difference in the sense that Dobbs makes a difference, in the sense that climate denial makes a difference, in the sense these are real things. So you can, and I'm right with you arm in arm with disdain for bourgeois politics, but I'm also going to vote. There's another reason I vote. That is because I've worked with people who gave their lives for the right to vote in the South. And that is serious. That they, they, they were not chumps and they didn't do stupid things. They were killed because they were trying to register voters. And that's a blood debt. And that's true worldwide, not just in this country. Worldwide, people are dying for the right to vote. All the flaws of our system, the Electoral College, the Supreme Court, the Senate, um, gerrymandering, money in politics, all that is true. And the way to solve it is not to not vote. It doesn't register. The ruling class doesn't want you to vote. And that's another reason I vote, because they don't want me to. And I also get very irritated with the third party people. But I'm as irritated as I am with Jill Stein, 
Um, and Cornell. And Cornell would be irritated with my friend Cornell. But the, but, <laughs> but, but the, the, the thing is, I want to say two things about that. One is if if the Green Party were serious about building a third party, I'd like to know what their strategy is and what tactics they're planning to use. Showing up every four years and putting your name on the ballot is not a strategy to build a third party. Building a third party in this country is almost impossible because of the structural blocks. But if you have a plan to overcome them, I'll join you. But I'm not going to think that an ego trip every four years makes any sense at all, that changes anything at all. However, if Harris loses and blames it on Jill Stein, I think she's wrong. I think she ran a bad campaign. You know, <laughs> in other words, I, I don't want to blame the left. I don't, I think, you know, Gore didn't lose Florida because of Ralph Nader. He lost because he's a stupid, ran a stupid campaign. You know, yeah, you see what I'm saying? Now yeah, you may disagree with that. The Supreme Carol. Court stopped the counting and I know it was the fucking Supreme Court. After we get rid of the Electoral College, next the Supreme Court. Next, the Senate. And then the president. Next, the president. And then capitalism. Okay? <laughs> That's the order. Huh? And, and close the Pentagon. And close all the foreign military. I think we're on the same page. But <laughs> that, 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 I took a lot of a lot of time to do that. It was probably too much. But that's why I think you should vote. And I think that if North Carolina, um, you know, goes for Trump. I'm going to blame you. No. <laughs> I promise. I promise. Him. But, but you see what I'm saying. I think you see what I'm saying. It, it's an argument to be had. And certainly you could argue that. Did, did you want to add, Ms. Travis? Um, no. Okay. So you're jumping out of your seat. Yeah, that's you responded. It's cool. Okay. <laughs> Anything else that people want to talk about? So wait, this is Alan, pass this back. <laughs> That's my polemic. Oh, wow, thank you. Um, wow, it's all right. I am a tenor socialist. You know, I have a, a chapter in the book called um, something like Anarchism and Freedom or something like that. And I begin with a story of, of uh, I guess it was almost 20 years ago, almost, that I, I was invited to go to Greece to speak at an anarchist convention. First thing I said to them when they picked me up at the airport was, you're anarchists and you're having a convention? Come on. <laughs> um, but I was just kidding them. But in the course of that visit, I got to meet Manolis Glesos, who um, was 90 years old at the time. And Manolis was famous throughout Greece and Europe for taking the um, Nazi flag off the Acropolis when the Germans had were controlling uh, Athens. And he was his brother was killed um, and he was pursued and ended up doing 10 years in prison, partly the Nazis, partly the Italians, partly the generals, fascist generals. But anyway, Modulus and I spent the day together. And, and after I was getting ready to leave, I would, he, he lived in an island way out in the archipelago. And we were walking to the boat and he said, you know, Bill, I think that the problem you have in the United States is similar to a problem we have in Greece. And that is people don't deep down have the confidence that they could run their own affairs. Mm. Really, we feel we need a mayor and we need a chief of police and we need a superintendent of schools. How can we do it by ourselves, right? And he said, if you had the confidence, you could overcome so many barriers. And he said, I think a lot of what it takes to build a movement is building the confidence that ordinary people exercising their agency can run their own affairs. It happened that I went back to Chicago just as um, just as there was a mayoral race and the, the unspeakably awful Rahm Emanuel was running against a field of 11 progressive people. And we kept trying to figure out who the progressive opponent would be. And we never did figure it out. Then Rahm Emanuel became the mayor. But at every meeting where the progressives would get together, I'd raise my hand and say, why do we need a mayor? And then people would say, Bill, shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? We need, we're gonna have a mayor, okay? And, but I had gotten the, I'd gotten the religion from, from Monolith. But, but the other thing that, that, I, that I really do believe strongly, because I sometimes call myself an anarchist or so, although I hate all labels, but I kind of call myself. And I think about Bakunin, who was considered the founder of anarchist socialism. And Bakunin always said, 
Freedom without socialism is predation and exploitation. But socialism without freedom is slavery and imprisonment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. How do we find a way to be free and to be socialist? And I think that's, so I kind of think of myself as an anarchist socialist in that regard, and still I'll vote. Still I'll vote. <laughs> okay, anybody else want to jump in? We have a little more time. Anybody? Um, I'm uh, interested in what you were saying at the beginning about the uh, individual freedom versus. A little uh, louder. Uh, I'm interested in what you were saying at the beginning about individual freedom and um, collective liberation. So some of us here are uh, in a group that bails out people um, get some amount of pretrial detention, and um, that, that feels like just getting one individual free. So how do we how do we make that part of uh, collective liberation struggle? I think, I mean, I don't so know. Would, would you be willing to repeat the question? So, you so the question, as I understand it, was we're talking about individual freedom versus collective liberation. And the comrade is involved in an organization that gets bails people out or gets people out of pretrial detention. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Well, I work very strongly in Illinois in the prisons. I work in several groups, including I teach in the prison. Um, so the question, you, you want to go back to the question of individual versus collective. To me, what you're doing is a collective effort and it involves individuals. The individual is very much a part of the collective, but what you're, when you say we have a group, you're already saying it's a political statement. We don't think people should be held in jails pre-trial. We think nobody should. And so we're working one person at a time or one campaign at a time. That's exactly parallel to what is going on in Illinois. I worked hard to get Ronaldo out of prison. I worked hard to get Jimmy out of prison. But my North Star was free them all. You know, but but you're not gonna free them all by shouting free them all. You're 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 working in the here and now, at the level you can work at, but your vision and your politics and your, your organizing strategy and statement is collective, or at least it sounds that way to me. I, the other thing you make me think is, because I teach in prison, I teach in Stateville prison, I teach memoir writing, and my teaching there absolutely follows the same pattern as my teaching at DePaul University, where I teach ethics, Parentheses, hats off to a Catholic university that hires a communist anarchist <laughs> atheist to teach ethics. Let's get a different perspective. Um, but, but I also teach at the University of Chicago, where I teach all history. But all of my, in every setting, I feel like compromised to some degree. The way my brother put it, who was a legendary high school teacher in Berkeley, California, he always said to me, I'm 65 or 70 percent an agent of the state mm -hmm. and 30 or 35 percent a free agent. Mm -hmm. But my free agency is lived to the fullest. And I am I understand the contradiction. I'm not pretending that I'm completely free, but I'm not collapsing into being just an agent of the state. Well, you can imagine the conversations we have teaching at Stateville. Those okay. are, we are an abolitionist organization. They are a caging institution. We disagree profoundly and fundamentally, but we also want to get in because we believe art and education are for everyone everywhere. So we want to get in. So do we make compromises? We do. Do we be nice when we're being searched? Pretty much. I got, <laughs> I got from the other day, I want to tell you. But you know, pretty much because we are walking a contradiction. Well, so are you. It's a contradiction because we want to get this guy out but we actually want them all. We want the whole policy to change and the whole politics to change. We want to do away with, we want to do with, away with cash bail. Mm -hmm. We want to, I mean, there's so many things we want to do. So that's part of what comes to my mind. One last thing comes to my mind. Our progressive um, governor, Fisker, um, we're all hoping he'll get a cabinet position under whoever gets elected president. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, um, <laughs> Because we want the lieutenant governor who's even better on criminal criminal legal matters. Who um, is that? 
uh, Stratton, um, Juliana. Juliana Stratton. And she's a black woman from the South Side. Oh. She's lovely. Um, but but um, Pritzker announced in the spring that he was going to close Stateville Prison, where I work, and Logan Prison, the women's equivalent. Stateville is 150 years old. It's toxic. Nobody's been able to drink the water there for five years. And you take a shower there at your own risk. You know, It's a terrible medieval dungeon. And Pritzker announced he was going to close these two prisons. And from our point of view, hooray, close those motherfuckers down, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so we were for it. But then he announced he was going to put a $900 million budget item in the Illinois budget to build a state-of-the-art prison. Mm -hmm. Now, who understood that better than anybody? My students. They understood it so well. The day it was announced, um, Jimmy said to me, well, he's proposing to build a dungeon for my grandkids. We know who's going to go there. We know who he has in mind. So rather than spend $900 million to address the problem, the crisis of mass incarceration, build schools, build health clinics, build mental health, you know, drug treatment, get the guns out of the fucking city, and so on and so on. You can think of a thousand things, build parks, build housing. How's the unhoused? Mm -hmm. My uh, our daughter-in-law, who's a, a novelist, a poet, and a brilliant organizer herself, she started a program where she went into the Chicago public schools, high schools. She taught kids to write sonnets, and then she began collecting sonnets under the prompt: "If you had nine hundred million dollars to make Illinois a flourishing and safe place, write a sonnet about what you would do." She's so far got about. 300. She wants to get a thousand and dump them on Pritzker's desk because nobody says build a prison. Right? <laughs> no kid says, Oh, I got a great idea. Let's have a prison. You can think of a 900 million other ideas before you think of a prison. So that's for me any problem that we can look at as individual has a social element. Any social problem has an individual element as well. So when I talk about collective liberation, for example, in the first chapter of the book, I talk about the Black Freedom Movement. It did involve individual rights, the right to drink at a fountain, the right to ride on a train. The right, all those are individual things, but they were in a collective setting. One last thought that comes to my mind is that, you know, I had mentioned when we began the guys on death row or this space here, that we create a public when we see each other fully as facing a similar obstacle. And, and that was true here with the crisis of the, of the storm, it was true. You know, we create publics. Okay. And, and one of the most exciting things, if you haven't seen it, you should see, is the birth of the disability movement and the, the documentary Crip Camp is one of the most thrilling things. But when you see it, if you've seen it, think back, what's thrilling about it is a group of people who were individuals and facing individual problems, just like every family, every family who has kids faces the problem of childcare. It's a social problem, but it's experienced individually. Every family, if they're lucky, eventually faces having to take care of the elders. Our three sons are deep into that crisis. You know, how do you take care of the old people? It's a social thing. Everybody has that problem but it's experienced as excruciatingly individual. Mm -hmm. What's wonderful moment in Crip Camp is the moment that this kid who'd been held in the basement and, and never, didn't go to school because she was in a wheelchair, this kid because he was blind, this kid because he had you know something else. And suddenly they're together and they identify, oh, we are disabled. And they find themselves in Berkeley and they say, well, there's some fucked up things going on. For example, I can't get my wheelchair up on the sidewalk. And they do a civil disobedience. They pour concrete onto the intersections. Mm -hmm. So a wheelchair, and then, wow, that's good for mothers pushing a baby. That's good for an old person pulling a grocery cart. Holy cow, that was civil disobedience. It was illegal. And then they did other things, but they identified themselves as a public and the individual experience became shared. 
and still it was individual. You know, so it's that it's that dialectic between me and us. And and I think the pronoun thing is, I love. Oh, I got to tell you a pronoun story. Maybe I'm. I know I'm running out of story, out of time. But I just want to tell you one story because this I was telling Carol and Steve this this morning, but it's a touching story to me. Um, we had one class at uh, Stateville Prison, which was 15 students from the prison and 15 students from the University of Chicago. And we were gonna have a mixed enrollment class. They were reading heavy texts. They were reading Erica Miners and Kanga Yamada Taylor and really heavy stuff and Robin Kelly. But they were gonna be these kids, you know, pretty privileged kids from an Ivy League type school and our guys in Stateville who were in their 40s, 50s, 60s. Younger kids, older students at Stateville. But I was asked, I was given the unenviable task of explaining pronouns to the guys at Stateville so that when the kids came down, it wouldn't be too embarrassing and the, the, the young people wouldn't be offended and the guys wouldn't, it wouldn't have, not, it wouldn't have gotten a little pre-idea of why that mattered to people. Get it? So you can see I wasn't happy to have to do that. So I went down. I explained pronouns um, to my students. And the first guy to speak said, you know, we've been in here a long time and um, the culture's moved on and we've gotten old. And I think it's important that we honor the kids. So I think we should just go along with what they say. I'll be he, him. Next guy to speak says, Reginald, that's a ridiculous. I don't even have pronouns. And Reginald says, I is a pronoun. What are you talking about? Everybody has pronouns. And I went to the next guy to speak. It got better and better. The next guy to speak said, you know, we had a white guy transfer into our block uh, last year. Not a bad guy, but he kept saying, I've never been around so many colored people. And he kept saying it. Finally, I took him aside. I said, we're not colored people. That's condescending, patronizing, racist. We're either African ancestor, African American, or Black. But stop calling us colored. And it did stop. So for that reason, I'm going to go with the kids and I'll be he, him. And it, it kept going like that. When the guy, about the sixth guy to speak said, you know, it took Muhammad Ali five years to get white people to call him Muhammad Ali. And for that reason, I'm going to be he, him. And, you know, everybody became he, him, except one guy, the guy who said, I don't have pronoun. Every time he introduced himself, he said, my pronoun is multitudes. And I thought that was good too. But the point is, they, they not only got it almost right away, but they got it better than any English professor I've talked to. You know, oh, that's not grammatically correct. Take a break. You know, you can do it. Um, you know, so I just loved it. And, and that's a, a, another example to me of kind of grace and willingness to, to grow and be alive rather than be dogmatic and stupid. And the dogma, when I talk about dogma, the thing I worry about is not the dogma of the Republican caucus in Congress. I worry about our dogma. I worry about us being stuck. And so, you know, I think we should all take a deep breath and be willing to change and learn and grow. And these guys gave me a great lesson in that, you know. All right, we're going to end very soon. If anybody has last words or last comments or... Anybody? Okay, my last comment then. Uh, I'll say again that you should buy books here at uh, Firestorm, support this worthy enterprise. Mm -hmm. Support what is your public space as well as the collective's good work. Um, but I think I want to say, I guess, one last thing, which is that there is a rhythm to being an activist or an organizer or even a moral person or a decent citizen or resident. And it's easy to say and difficult to enact, but I think I want to just say it to end. And it involves, I think, four steps at least. I, this is how I think of it. You can't be a good organizer or activist or teacher or resident if you don't open your eyes and pay attention. You have to pay attention to the world. And you don't pay attention to it once and get it right. You have to open your eyes again and again every day because the wor world is a swirling mass of contradiction mm -hmm. and so are you. And so you keep opening your eyes, keep saying, how do I name this political moment? What's going on? What should I do? What is to be done? The second thing you have to do is be astonished. 
And this is harder than it sounds. You have to be astonished at both the beauty, the loveliness, the ecstasy, the joy that human beings can create and be astonished at the unnecessary suffering. And if you're not astonished every day, then you're getting used to things you shouldn't get used to. So when I stop crying, when I see homeless kids in Chicago, wake me the fuck up, you know, because it's wrong, it's heartbreaking, it's horrifying, and we can't normalize it, can't let it be normal. Um, so we have to be astonished again and again. Mm -hmm. Then we have to act. And as I said earlier, you don't have to do everything, but you have to do something. And doing something is a, is a great antidote to despair. Mm -hmm. It's a great antidote to, and, and by the way, I think grief is different than despair. Despair is what individuals do who are paralyzed. Grief is something we can do collectively and ought to, because there's a lot to grieve, but we have to act. And then the fourth step is you have to doubt, rethink and reconsider. And that's where for a period of time, the weather underground went off the tracks. We forgot to rethink. We forgot, you know, and I think whatever you do, whatever action you take, I always, as a teacher, I always have a pedagogical standard for assessing that action. And the pedagogical standard is, did I teach and did I learn? If I taught and I learned, great. Let's build on that. If all I did was look great on the nightly news in my bandana with my Molotov cocktail, that's just not good enough. It's just too simple, really. And so the standard is that I teach, that I learn. And then you have to rethink and start over. Open your eyes, pay attention, act. I mean, you have to pay attention, be astonished, act, doubt, repeat. And to me, if we all were trying to hard to follow that rhythm, not just individually, but collectively, we would be in a space of movement making, mm -hmm. in a space of learning and growing, which is what we have to do if we're going to ever build that irresistible social force, that irresistible fire from below that will bring about the kinds of changes we need both now and in the future. So thank you all for coming. And thank you.